All right. Uh, welcome, everyone, to uh, the third edition of the Elections Weekly uh, podcast. Uh, I'm Eric. I'll be your host for this week. Uh, Nick is off. Um, we decided like a couple format changes this time around. So I'm going to try and keep, com uh, keep, uh, sorry, keep the discussion a little bit more, uh, compact. So on the docket this week, uh, we have Oklahoma's fifth congressional district race, um, looking at one of the toss up house races to look at. Uh, we're going to be going over some of the house races in the Midwest, continuing our series on the house elections. And we also have, uh, we're going to look at some of the latest Senate polling and Senate election details. Um, so I'll go ahead and hand it off to Kraz uh, mm -hmm. for uh, uh, the Oklahoma Five Second to start off with, uh, because he just wrote an excellent article, got some great coverage about the 5th Congressional District's race. Uh, yeah, so this was this was a cool one to look at. Um, obviously, kind of the uh, biggest upset of the night back in 2018. Um, and what was interesting to look at is uh, her performance um, compared to Drew Edmondson, who was a Democratic nominee for governor. Um, so while uh, Kendra Horn won by about one and a half points, she was actually probably dragged over the finish line by Drew Edmondson's performance. He won uh, Oklahoma five by about nine points. So she underran him by almost 8%. Um, and the reason that's important is because, you know, Trump won Oklahoma five by 13%. Uh, so, you know, if she wants to survive, she has to be outrunning the top of the ticket by a significant margin, not the other way around. And that's not what happened in 2018. Um, so, you know, obviously she's proved her chops as a campaigner, um, but Russell was lazy. Her likely opponent, Stephanie Bice, is a suburban woman, um, you know, establishment favorite, um, seems to be a strong candidate, strong fundraiser. Uh, so, you know, Kendra Horn is gonna have to go from underrunning the top of the ticket by eight to outrunning it by something like 10. Um, and that was, it's hard for me to see happening, um, which is why I was very pessimistic on her chances after, after looking into it. Um, but I guess anything's possible. Um, but it, it, her, the numbers looked pretty grim for her in all honesty. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. Might I, um, in, I'd like to, um, add that, um, you know, Trump won Oklahoma fifth district by 13 points. Um, this time around, I don't see him doing that well in Oklahoma five. I think he'll win it by probably mid single digits at, you know, at best for him. Um, but like you said, if Kendra Horn is underperforming Joe Biden, she's not going to win. Mm -hmm. But um, one, um, one thing that she does have going in her favor is the fact that Trump is not going to win Oklahoma's fifth district by double digits again. Like it's kind of hard to imagine that. Well, if I can chime, chime back in about that. Um, well, yeah, I think he's going to do worse. Um, one of the reasons I was a little bit more pessimistic on Biden's chances in the district was just because, you know, Oklahoma City is gradually suburbanizing, gradually becoming, you know, more populated, more diverse. Um, but it's not becoming those things at as fast a clip as, say, you know, the Charleston suburbs where you have South Carolina's first or the Atlanta suburbs, um, you know, or even parts of like L.A., Chicago, et cetera. Um, and so while definitely there's some movement there, I think you're going to see an electorate in 2020 that is pretty similar in composition to the electorate you saw in 2016. Um, now, granted, I think Trump will do worse, but it's not hard for me to see him winning it by 10 points or eight or nine, um, you know, close to that. So that was just where I, I fell in terms of um, how I see the district voting at the presidential level. Um, I agree with, I actually agree with denials and there are a few reasons why. Uh, the first is that I was reading a few articles basically back in 2016 uh, when it was noticed that Trump was uh, majorly underperforming Republicans in many congressional districts, especially in suburban areas of large cities like LA and Dallas and Houston. Uh, and there was a sort of a consensus among some people, uh, some consultants and strategists, that that was sort of the floor uh, of the, the issues that Trump would be facing and that uh, suburbanites would not be drifting even more so towards the Democrats in 2018. Obviously, that was proven incorrect. Uh, Basically, I think that Trump in some ways hit a ceiling at that time with suburbanites and more suburbanites drifted over to the left in 2018 and then a lot of people didn't expect it. Uh, secondly, I'd like to add that I was on a call with uh, Senator James Langford basically last Friday on Zoom and I was able to ask him a question pretty much pertaining to Oklahoma's 5th District because he represented the district before he became a senator. He's very much aware uh, of the, the sympathies and the sentiments of the people in the district. Uh, a lot of them 
uh, suburbanites, but a lot of them are sort of bound by very religious Christian convictions. Um, a lot of them are, are college educated, but uh, especially in the city of Oklahoma, you see that suburban shift. And so I wanted to ask them about that. Uh, but Kendra Horn is sort of a mixed bag in some ways. Uh, on one hand, she wasn't seen as, as a total supporter of Nancy Pelosi. Uh, she was seen as sort of an independent voice in Congress who would be willing to stand up for Oklahoman values in a very Republican leading district that Trump is bound to win. I do think he'll win by single digits, but he will win it nevertheless. However, um, Kendra Horn did vote for impeachment. She has voted on pretty uh, party line issues for the Democrats. And so she's not the most independent voice in the, in the Democratic caucus. And that might be an issue for some voters in the region. And so I do believe, um, as some of you put, that she will have to outperform Biden that, sorry, drastically. Uh, and that Biden, even though he's a good candidate, he's not going to win Oklahoma's fit. Kendra Horn is going to have to pull a miracle if she wants to stay on the ballot. However, I do think that in some ways uh, she has a, a much better chance than some people would expect. I'd also like to um, point out that um, in 2016, Trump only won Oklahoma County with 51% of the vote. Um, you know, it's kind of hard to see how he can improve on something like that in 2020, um, given how, you know, Oklahoma, Oklahoma County is, you know, urban, suburban. So it's kind of hard to see him improving on something like that in 2020. And, you know, that's where most of the votes are in Oklahoma's fifth district. So um, if he's doing worse in Oklahoma County, he's definitely doing worse in the district altogether. But to your point, um, to your point, I do agree with, you know, with the idea that Kendra Horn is more of a party line vote than someone like, I don't know, Joe Cunningham or or um, Ben McAdams who have established independent brands in their districts. Like they were both, um, both um, Ben McAdams and Joe Cunningham were endorsed by local Republicans. Um, to my knowledge, no local Republicans have endorsed Kendra Horn in Oklahoma City. So, um, you know, I could be wrong, but I don't think so. But um, to, but um, I do agree with the uh, with the um, with the notion that Kendra Horn really hasn't established some sort of independent streak like someone like Joe Cunningham. And you know, will that hurt or will that help her in the long run? I don't know. But you know, to 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 the earlier point, um, you know, if Trump is doing worse in Oklahoma County, I don't see how he does better in the district altogether, or you know, comes close to matching his 2016 performance there. Mm -hmm. And that's a good gonna point. So I'm going to, go sorry, I'm going to pull mm -hmm. up the map here real quick because uh, there we go. Yeah. So um, the article that we had done had several of these maps. So I'm going to go ahead and pull these up to kind of give credence to what some of you were saying. Um, so if you can see this right over here, um, Drew Edmondson won the district by about nine percentage points, actually a little bit over nine percentage points, while Horn only won it by about 1.4. This is actually the opposite of how people had thought Oklahoma would go. They thought Drew Edmondson would do great in like Little Dixie and some of the more rural areas when he just didn't. Um, his strength was in urban areas. So that was kind of the precinct loyalty there. You go a little bit lower, um, you can see kind of how um, Edmondson, uh, Republicans actually outran um, Democrats basically everywhere in the House races um, in Oklahoma. Um, not even not even a debate. I mean, if you look at this over here. And then um, this is the presidential election results. Trump won the district with uh, 14 by 14 points, uh, which was well behind the Senator um, Lankford, who won it by a very large margin, um, was not remotely competitive. And it was his home base as well, if you want to incorporate yeah, that. Into the mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I wanted to add something in about Oklahoma 5, though, that I was going to say earlier, and I was basically going to bring up that even if the Democrats lose Oklahoma 5 and other vulnerable seats like it, it won't necessarily at all impact their control of the House of Representatives, which is why Republicans have kind of fallen off the wagon for the House campaign this year. That is, well, that is, hurting. That is true. Um, I also just wanted to, to speak of a few things as well. Um, I think that there were some underlying factors that really contributed uh, to Edmondson's swamping state in the district. And I think that Mary Fallon's just general unpopularity during her gubernatorial terms really contributed to it. So I don't think that it was necessarily entirely uh, based on national trends. I think it was more of the, the sentiments and the consensus among, among Oklahomans that they wanted to change, uh, which obviously didn't happen because it ended up winning by around 12, I believe. Uh, but also I think that uh, based on what I've seen and based on what I've heard, Steve Russell generally is just an uncharismatic candidate and a legislature as well. 
Uh, mm -hmm. And so I don't think he had necessarily a brand to really show himself. And when Mike Bloomberg started to pour money last minute into the campaign of Kendra Horn, the district, uh, Steve Russell didn't really have anything uh, to sort of rely upon. And he didn't campaign that much. Uh, he expected, expected it, as most people did, to be a likely to safe Republican district, uh, pretty much a, a guaranteed win for Republicans. But again, I think that there are some underlying factors and, and some movements within the state itself, not necessarily national, that contributed to such democratic strength in the district. Mm -hmm. Yeah, nobody took the race seriously. Steve Russell certainly did. <laughs> the only person I know of who who was ringing the bell this early was my friend Noah Rudnick, who was put, pushing the alarm bells about this district a year before. And I know I certainly made fun of him for it. Um, and it turned out both of our pet races were correct. Mine was the Florida Senate race, his was Oklahoma 5. Um, but, I mean, he absolutely nailed it. Part of it was the third party voting. Um, people kind of assumed those people who went third party would just flock back to the Republicans. Um, in 2018, it didn't happen. It's actually they went the other way. Most of them who voted for the Libertarian or for another candidate, they they either didn't vote, you know, this time, or they turned around and voted for Kendra Horn or Drew Edmonds. Um, yeah, and going back to the um, presidential race, um, a lot of in states like Oklahoma and um, you know a lot of those states like Oklahoma, Kentucky, West Virginia, a lot of the vote for Trump was a vote against Hillary Clinton. And, you know, there's no Hillary Clinton running this time. So, you know, Trump, uh, Biden is still not going to be not going to do well in these states, obviously. But districts like Oklahoma five or um, I don't know, um, Kentucky sixth, maybe those are districts where he can improve on Hillary Clinton's margin. You know, they're largely urban, suburban, you know. And well, if you look at Steve Russell's performance in 2018, essentially, like many Republicans across the country, many of whom didn't exactly lose re-election uh, if they were asleep at the wheel, because obviously a lot of the seats ended up flipping. People saw those coming, but some of the other upset races and some of the incumbents that ended up narrowly holding on. Russell was definitely one of those where he was not expecting to lose to the same degree, and his campaign could be described as falling asleep at the wheel in a way. <laughs> he was a shot over the bow when he ended up losing that race for sure. Yeah, I know for a fact he didn't take it seriously. Um, yeah, um, another, um, you know, I hate to get off topic here, but Rob Woodall in Georgia was another perfect example of that. Like, he didn't take that race seriously at all. He started running ads at the last minute, and um, it ended up being the closest house race in 2018. Now he's retiring, so. Well, well but just to um, chime in on this a little bit, like, Obviously, yes, Russell didn't take it seriously, but it seems like Bice is. And I think that's one of the reasons that I ended up being a little more pessimistic on Horn's chances mm -hmm. is because Bice is taking it a lot more seriously. And, you know, if I could boil down those maps, it's that, you know, the swing voters, the crossover voters, the voters that were splitting their tickets, they weren't splitting their tickets to vote for Kendra Horn. They were splitting their tickets to vote for Drew Edmondson and then vote for Steve Russell. So despite Russell's incredibly lazy and totally asleep at the wheel campaign, he still won a, almost a sizable enough chunk of Edmondson voters to get pulled over the finish line. And so as I see it, mm -hmm. it's like Horn has to go from losing voters that are splitting their ticket to winning them, which is possible. She's an incumbent now and she you know, has a ton of money and a lot of attention, but she's also running against Stephanie Bice, who I think is consensus a much stronger candidate than Steve Russell was. Yeah. So even if Trump does worse, yeah. that's why I still have a hard time seeing her pulling it out. I wanted, to bring up one more, I wanted to bring up one more thing about this district just because we were talking about the importance of Drew Edmondson to Horn's victory. And I just had a quick map to, to show. So basically to talk about the long-term trends in Oklahoma. Well, yeah, I obviously. Do you guys see it? No. Uh, no, I don't no. Send it over to me and I'll put it on the screen. Yeah, here. You guys? Just a quick thing with Drew Edmondson. I mean, yeah, that was the key. I mean, Mary Found as well was oh, okay. very, very popular in that seat as well with her education cuts and many other things. So that probably had its role also in Russell going down as well. And if you look at it, like you like you said, I mean, the, the Democratic support in Little Dixie obviously decreased heavily mm -hmm. between the two elections because both were decided by similar margins, but the Democratic coalition was altered both times. I mean, if you look at the swing, the Oklahoma's 5th District is where Edmondson expanded more than any other uh, region of the state at that point. So that sums up, I guess, where Oklahoma County is going. And even though uh, wow. Biden is not going to come close to winning, it's certainly going to be closer this time. 
Mm -hmm. And um, in that uh, it could be a county that Democrats could expand into in the future over the next decade. I didn't realize mm -hmm. that race only shifted one percentage point from 2014 to 2018. That's surprising. Yeah, Joe mm -hmm. Dorman actually did fairly well in a red wave in 2014, probably because well, because he had a pretty strong block of supporters in Little Dixie. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and in that map, the, um, in that map there, you can really see where the base, where the coalitions in Oklahoma are heading. Like you know, Oklahoma yeah, for used, sure. to, um, used to be Eastern Oklahoma, used to be Democratic stronghold. Now it's moving towards cities like um, Oklahoma City, um, Tulsa. Like you know, a lot of the large cities in Oklahoma. That's where you know most of the um, Democratic strength is headed. Yes, I mean, that's even, yeah. I mean, just keep in mind, this yeah. shows just how stark the change really has been. I mean, in 2014, Dorman, I mean, Edmondson only improved about 1.5% off of Dorman's margin. And Dorman did not even win Oklahoma County or any of the counties in Oklahoma's 5th District. And those were largely the only way that Edmondson kept pace with Stitt in the 2018 election was that region of the state. If you removed that, he would have been defeated in a landslide because of how much his support declined in Little Dixie. Yeah. yeah. One thing I'll mention for Oklahoma is to keep in mind for the future is we don't know if Oklahoma will ever have a competitive governor race again in the next 20 years. But uh, Stitt has been alienating a lot of the Native American tribes. Actually, not a lot of them. He's been alienating all of them. They've literally all united and said they're angry with him. Um, and so you might see some of those little Dixie areas, if that's the case, swing a little bit more towards the Democrats if, if that actually goes to the lower level. That could be a viable coalition. It's just if you're winning Oklahoma County, you're winning Tulsa, and you're winning Native American votes, that can at least make it close. Not just not, you know, an 11% loss in a year where you really should be doing better against an incumbent who is just frankly abysmal. I mean, she had an 18% yeah. approval rating or something like that. I mean, I, I mean, think I think another important thing to talk about since we're on the Oklahoma Five discussion is even though I think Kendra Horn will end up losing in a competitive election. If she somehow does pull out a victory, her seat's definitely going to be chopped in redistricting. And uh, yeah. I thought we could talk about a little bit about what Oklahoma Republicans are going to do. How would they draw a new district to make it a, a vote sink for the Republicans? Um, well, I'd like to, um, you know, I'd like to start off by saying, in a way, the results in Oklahoma five this year really won't matter much in the long term because yeah. if public if Republicans win, I think I mentioned this a few days ago. If Republicans manage to beat Kendra Horn, like, you know, Democrats are still going to be favored to hold the House. Um, if Kendra Horn wins, um, you know, her district is, you know, a pretty easy target for Oklahoma Republicans in, redist in redistricting. So in a way, like, you know, Oklahoma five in the long term really won't matter much this year. Uh, yeah, I want to go back to yeah. that. First, I just want to respond a little bit to Eric's point about the Native American shift potentially happening. Um, I believe uh, it was the 2018 congressional elections uh, where there were some exit polls that showed that in Oklahoma, uh, the Native American population voted for Republicans 50% to 47%. Uh, I believe that that's, that's where the numbers were. Uh, and so, yeah, there's a lot of, of newfound Republican strength among not only whites, but also Native Americans in sort of the Little Dixie area. Uh, uh, back in 2018, um, Drew Edmondson was only able to win, I believe, Muskogee County uh, sort of in that by one vote. Yeah. Was it really by one vote? It was. It's really impressive, but wow. he did win it by just a single vote. So Yeah, and that really shows, too. I mean, the fact that even that was incredibly close. Um, but, uh, you know, Oklahoma Oklahoma is a state that experienced a lot, a lot of shifts recently. Uh, and even back in 2012, there was a Democratic representative for Little Dixie with, uh, with Dan Boren. Uh, one thing I wanted to bring up sort of about these these trends and sort of the shift that we're seeing is one of my favorite maps actually is actually the, the 2006 gubernatorial election in Oklahoma. Which is basically, oh yeah, Kraz map then. Yes. Yeah. Uh, it's basically Brad Henry, I believe, versus uh, Ernie Istook. And Ernie Istook mm -hmm. was a representative for the fifth district. And while it basically looks like uh, Brad Henry ran up the score in the entire state because he basically did, if you look closer, if you look at the fine print, you'll notice that while he did exceptionally well in Little Dixie, uh, the Democrat Brad Henry did not do as well in the Oklahoma City area. And so it really shows you that even, even during these wave years, even during these non-federal races that seem to be uh, largely independent from national trends, you still see that there's a, there's a great uh, wealth of Republican strength, traditional strength in the Ho Oklahoma City area. Yeah, so if you look at that, you'll see uh, Little Dixie is a lot more darkly blue than the Oklahoma City area is. If you look at Oklahoma City and Canadian County uh, and, Nor you know, the Norman City area, 
Cherokee County, we'll see that there's actually some shifts there. And the one area, obviously, where uh, Ernieistic one was basically the panhandle, which is actually interesting when we look at that, too, because it's a very largely Hispanic area now with a lot of cattle ranchers and people like that. But much like, uh, much like I believe, Hidalgo County, New Mexico, uh, it sort of takes on this blue county trend, or sorry, this blue collar trend, rather, where it's starting to move more to the right in recent years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the panhandle is basically Texas. I mean, really, it should be part of Texas. And it votes like it's part of the Texas panhandle. <laughs> yeah. Is it me or should all panhandles be a part of the bordering states, like the Florida panhandle? That's basically Alabama. Alabama. <laughs> yeah. I've created, no, I've created a map of, of states where I just abolished all the panhandles. It's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. anyway, I mean, in West Virginia, with no panhandle. It just there's mm -hmm. no panhandles in West Virginia. That's what my map did. Mm -hmm. Well, going back to the race in Oklahoma five, um, Stephanie Bice, you know, she's a good candidate, but she hasn't cleared the Republican field, which is interesting in and of itself. Yeah. Like, you know, there's a there's a very high likelihood, you know, a non-zero chance that she ends up in a runoff with someone. Um, and I don't know when the runoff or the, I don't even know when the primary is. I, I think it's in like June or I don't know. Do you, does anyone know when it is the, in Oklahoma, the primary? Is it on June 9th? I'm not sure. I'll, I'll look it up. Mm. Anyway, um, I think um, Stephanie Bice, if she does end up in a runoff, um, I don't know if that will help Kendra Horn or not, but that will give her more time to raise money, which is it's, really it's on which, June 30th. June yeah. oh, man, that's yes. late. Wow. When, 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 when would the runoff be? Uh, let me check that date. That's somewhere probably really late. That's not what you want to be in a situation. Yeah. I mean, but she's but on top of that. She she definitely doesn't not like Niall said. The Republican field is not cleared. I mean, you have Janet Brisey and Terry Nice who are all competitive candidates running against her. And even though she's the establishment pick, quote unquote, it's not like South Carolina one where Nancy Mace has effectively cleared the field of credible challengers. Mm -hmm. And she really hasn't done that, so <laughs> yeah, she really yeah, it's, well, it's yeah, just it's, not to the same extent as Oklahoma Five because mm -hmm. yeah, I um, yeah, mm -hmm. I compare more. is the type of candidate you want. Like she's a she's a woman, she's a college. I mean, she went to Oklahoma State. She's uh, from a suburban area. Popular she's, state legislator. Yeah, exactly. She's the exact type of candidate you want. She should be mm -hmm. clearing this field immediately, um, mm -hmm. ASAP. What were you going to say, Niall? Yeah. Like, I was going to say, I would compare it more to, even though it's a Clinton district, I would compare it more to California 39, where young Kim practically cleared the field. You know, yeah, that's, that's a better example. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Even though it's a Clinton district, you know. Anyway. Part um, of that young Kim's a good candidate. Is that she's a good enough candidate that Republicans just wanted to get her out of the way. Uh, just get, yeah. the, get the field out of the way. Even in like oh, even in California twenty five, the, the the field wasn't cleared for Mike Garcia. Mike Garcia had to fight his way up from the bottom to get through that race. Um, yeah, and he did do that, and he did do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, think, I mean, I think, sorry, I think California thirty ninth is actually sort of an interesting comparison because in California thirty ninth, John Cox won in twenty eighteen, so it was a Republican, even though Clinton won in twenty sixteen. Whereas Oklahoma fifth is sort of on the other hand. Uh, with a, a Democrat candidate for governor winning there in 2018, even though it was a Trump district in 2016. Just throw a corollary there. Mm. No, the, there's this, um, people have been saying that um, that um, Joe Cunningham is more vulnerable than Kendra Horn because of the gubernatorial results in those districts. Like in those districts, like in South Carolina one, um, Henry McMaster still carried South Carolina one, but in Oklahoma five, um, Drew Edmondson carried Oklahoma five. So, you know, I just wanted to hear what you guys thought about that. So I'd just like to add something brief onto that. I would I would personally uh, argue, especially after reading Kraz's article, too, that Oklahoma five is more vulnerable than South Carolina one. And I feel like that's the consensus of a lot of election Twitter, uh, basically for three reasons. One, Cunningham has established a brand for himself, like Niall says, same with Ben McAdams. You haven't seen that with Kendra Horn and Anthony Brindisi, two other vulnerable freshman Democrats. And um, well, in, 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 in um, Anthony Brindisi's defense, he's running against Claudia Tenney again. So. Yeah, yeah. That's, <laughs> that uh, continuing what I was going to say as well, South Carolina won. I would almost be willing to bet a lot of money that it'll be won by Biden by a or no won by Trump by a significantly smaller Small margin than, than Trump wins the Oklahoma County and Oklahoma's fifth district by. And I think that's going to help Cunningham, especially with him outrunning Biden in the district. 
And um, Joe Cunningham has already proven that he can run ahead of the top of the ticket. Kendra Horn has done that yet. And if now, I could be fair, oh. yeah. Sorry, go ahead, Chris. Yeah, I was gonna catch uh, a good time on this too. Like, uh, one of the reasons I was a little more bullish on South Carolina's first for Democrats is like Charleston is a rapidly growing, rapidly diversifying metro area in a way that Oklahoma City is not. Um, you know, not to the same yeah. degree. You know, there are young, liberal minded people moving into South Carolina one every single day. You know, but probably thousands since 2016. Additionally, there are lots of young voters entering the electorate in South Carolina's first. Um, usually they skew, they're going to skew non white versus Oklahoma five. I would assume they skew a lot whiter. Um, and I mean, yeah, again, also Cunningham has proved he can outrun the top of the ticket, and he has proved that there are people that will split their tickets for him, not against him. Now, to be fair, to be fair, yeah, to be fair to Cunningham, or to be fair to the Republicans there, Katie Arrington was not a good candidate. She was an abysmal candidate. Uh, she was a, she was a car crash of a candidate before she got into a car crash. I mean, it was just it was just not a good situation for like it was the worst case scenario. And May, May and Nancy May should be a good candidate for that area. But and, um, kind of I of, yeah, I was going to say I don't know where. Um, Mm -hmm. I was just, I'm sorry to interrupt. I was just going to say, I don't know where um, May stands on offshore drilling, but part of what dragged Katie Arrington down was her stance against. I Russell believe Jesus she's and, against the offshore drilling, from what I yeah. remember recalling. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Katie Coast Arrington, area, part of what dragged her down was um, her support of offshore drilling. So, yeah. I was going to mention that as well, um, and you said it very nicely, but uh, I think that uh, in terms of South Carolina's first district, issues are far more localized just because. Uh, with Oklahoma's fifth district, I think that some of the issues that are plaguing that district, especially when it comes to things like oil, are also issues that are experiencing uh, or that are experienced by neighboring districts. And so mm -hmm. South Carolina is sort of in a, in a unique and sort of precarious position. Uh, and there are a lot of Republican elected officials who are local, uh, some mayors of cities in the district, who are also very vehemently opposed to offshore drilling. And I think that those kinds of local issues are what help them gravitate towards a candidate He's very independent, like Joe Cunningham. There aren't any local issues like that in Oklahoma Five that you, that Kendra Horn can just go off of and be like, "That's the issue I back." That, well, that oil was a big oil issue. was a big issue. Oil was a big issue in Oklahoma. Yeah, yes, yes, that yes. would be just supporting oil or opposing it. I mean, there's no one in Oklahoma who's going to be like, "You know what? I don't like oil." Even like the Democratic right. Senate candidate that people want is like, "Yeah, I support climate. I, you know, I care about climate change, but I don't want to also get rid of oil." Like. There's a yeah. there's a realistic expectation there that there's some things you can't do, whereas Arrington seemed to have this bizarre belief that coastal voters would be fine with having their coast have uh, have offshore drilling right off the shore of some of the best coastline in the country, some of the yeah. most expensive yeah. coastline yeah. in the country. <laughs> yeah, and even sort of like fracking, uh, it's pretty it's pretty much down partisan lines in a way when you, when you look at who supports it and who's against it. Oklahoma is a state that is very much in support of that practice despite its, its supposed environmental concerns and damages. But something like offshore drilling is something that you can unite people on both sides of the aisle. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I mean, it, it, it can unite the NIMBYs who, or the NIMBYs who just don't want to have that off the shore, and it can unite you know, the environmentalists who, who have you know, concerns. Pretty much the only people who are going to support it are like conservative businessmen and people who like oil, which they're probably not a majority in that area. Um, as we've seen, you know, and, and there's been similar examples in Massachusetts with wind turbines. People don't want wind turbines off the coast either. Um, but I think that's a good point to move off of for Oklahoma. Um, arguably, I don't know what region Oklahoma falls into. I consider it more in the southwest. But right about it in the Midwest, there's a lot of races that are, <laughs> that are um, I mean, Midwestern area is going to be a major, major battleground in 2020 and so we're going to go over some of these important races i'm going to go ahead and pull up a map of kind of the midwest results last cycle and so you can kind of see what um what we're talking about here um depending on what yeah. you mean by the midwest it could mean everything from north dakota all the way over to uh, mm -hmm. sort of like ohio essentially Kentucky. i, I would yeah. probably say it's over to ohio because we counted pennsylvania in our northeastern region last mm -hmm. time so mm -hmm. i guess we'll also yeah. start off by saying the Midwest was by far one of the most interesting regions of the 2018 midterms. Democrats had gains all across the country, obviously, and then. But the interesting thing about the Midwest is that two out of the three Republican gains actually came from the Midwest as well. Both of them in districts that Trump won, and Minnesota's 
first district and its eighth district with Jim Hagedorn and uh, Pete Stauber, and both of them were also open seats. And uh, as well, you had Colin Peterson, who's now very vulnerable this year, largely because he has a better opponent in Fishbach uh, than Dave Hughes. You had him essentially holding on to that seat, which voted for Trump by 30 points, even in uh, 2018 as a blue wave, so it helped him. But my overlying belief with the Midwest, if you look at the seats that flipped to Democrats here, um, you have Haley Stevens and Alyssa Slotkin in Michigan, and um, you also have Sean Caston in Illinois 6, and uh, Lauren Underwood, who defeated Randy Holdgren. Now, if you look at these races in 2020, yeah, if you want to zoom in there, Haley Stevens is very safe for re-election. Uh, Sean Caston's running against Gian Ives, who is literally dumpster fire candidate, so both of them are pretty much safe for re-election. <laughs> Uh, even Slotkin is fairly safe for re-election and Underwood as well, running against Jim Overweiss. Now, the Iowa races are by far the most interesting in the Midwest because mm -hmm. Iowa has two, actually three Democratic-held congressional districts that are 100% going to be competitive this cycle, One, as in toss-ups or potentially lean Democratic if you look at Rita Hart's uh, bid in the second district of Iowa there. But uh, just real quick before I pass it off to someone else to add some things, in Iowa, uh, which is their primary is on June 2nd, which is coming up, 99% sure. So uh, in the second district, it was held by a long time by Dave Lobsack, who was elected in 2006, and he finally retired this cycle. Rita Hart is the Democratic favorite there and arguably the favorite for the entire general election in the seat, even though all four of the districts did vote for Trump in 2016. Uh, if you look at that, her opponents are uh, Marionette Miller-Meeks, who's been a perennial candidate and nominee for this House seat twice before in 2010 and 2014. And um, she's running against Bobby Schilling, who used to represent Sherry Bustos' old congressional district. Looking at this primary, I'd honestly argue that Meeks is the favorite. Carpetbagging doesn't play well, even if it's just directly across the border of your state. And on top of that, uh, Meeks is also the best fundraiser in the Republican primary, though she's still heavily trailing uh, Rita Hart in total fundraising. But uh, Bobby Schilling hasn't really raised anything. In the first district, uh, to the north of it, it was represented by Rod Blum, who lost to uh, Abby Finkenauer, as you all know. And uh, this is probably the best Republican recruit in the state of Iowa, Ashley Hinson. That's going to be a toss-up race. It's going to be a very close race. And uh, if you look at the third district, the other competitive district in the state, Congressman David Young, the former congressman, is making a bid for his old seat against Cindy Axney. And uh, even though the third district is technically more favorable to Republicans than the first district, many uh, punditry organizations, including Stabato's Crystal Ball, have actually rated the third district as being democratic, making uh, actually a stronger incumbent than Finkenauer. That might have something to do with the fact that Hinton's stronger, uh, stronger opponent than former Congressman Young. Um, and then the final thing in Iowa is the fourth district, <laughs> where you've got Steve King, obviously, and I know you guys are going to really love to talk about this. Oh, yeah. Being challenged by Randy Feenstra and uh, a bevy of other Republican candidates that are really just all, uh, how would you say this? It's like an echo chamber, and they're all clones of each other trying to oppose Steve King. I think a better strategy for them, considering King was up in the last internal poll, they should have figured, why don't we run one challenger against King instead of multiple challengers that will split the vote? But in the end of the day, I think King will beat Finster in the primary, and Scholten will have trouble ever eclipsing his 2018 margin, especially in a presidential year, because the fourth is the reddest part of Iowa. So uh, I would end up saying that King will win re-election, unfortunately, and the fact that Kevin McCarthy is going to give him his committees back, potentially, in the next term, uh, bolsters his argument, because before he was criticized for not having a seat on any ag committees to argue for the district, which has a high farming population. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So yeah, Iowa so, is actually fascinating to me because it all four congressional districts can be competitive. They could be theoretically competitive this cycle. Um, like if you look at Steve King's district, it's a it's a district that Trump won sixty one to thirty four, and a state where he won by ten points. The other three districts all went about forty eight, forty nine percent towards him, with forty five for Clinton. So all pretty competitive. Four should not be competitive under any circumstance, but Steve King has just made it incredibly easy to not want to reelect him in that sort of district because of his repeated racist, white nationalist, whatever you want to call it. I think he was okay with that term being applied to him. <laughs> Comments. Um, from what I last heard about is that the other Republicans on the steering committee are refusing to do this. They don't want to give Steve King anything back. Um, they want him to be gone and completely understandable because he's, he's a garbage, um, garbage candidate who should not have office in America. Um, but 
the the one problem I think for Democrats in the fourth is even if Steve King wins, it's not going to be as good for them this time because last time it was just kind of do you like Steve King or not? It was a referendum on that, less on the Democratic candidate. If I recall right, the Democratic candidate against him this time or is the same as it was last time, um, who was um, J.D. Shulton. And he's yep. way to the left of what you would expect for someone running in that sort of seat. I mean, he's an outright progressive. Um, he's not running a conservative campaign. He's not trying to appeal to that area. Um, so it would be hard. It's kind of like Nate McMurray in New York. It's kind of hard for him to win outside of a fluke because he's just a little bit, once you learn about him, you're like, People who might otherwise not like Steve King might not want to vote for someone who's going to vote with, you know, Nancy Pelosi on 100 percent of the issues. As, and when he disagrees, it would be because it's not it's not progressive enough. Like that yeah. would be that would be the one issue I would see for for them in that district. Um, yeah. So um, if I'd like to chime in on the Iowa um, races. I do agree with. Um, Harrison's point that Ashley Henson is the strongest candidate that Iowa Republicans have recruited for um for one of those congressional seats this cycle um and if you look at um ashley henson's perf at, uh, at, excuse me abby finkenauer's performance in 2018 let me see if i can find um, um like there were several um obama trump counties that she didn't win like uh, howard county most notable most notably like it went from um you know obama wanted by double digits both times and then it went to, it went to trump by like um by like uh, 57 36 in, t in 2012 howard county was 59 was 63 39 for um obama and in 2016 it was 57 um 37 for um trump and um, if you'll give me one second i want to see how um finkenauer did there um she didn't win it i know that for a fact but in but in, but in um i was first district there were several obama trump counties that finkenauer didn't win and I think that's why she is more vulnerable than someone like Cindy Axney, who only really needs to win one county in order to win re-election. Polk County in Iowa's third district, you know, that's home of Des Moines. It casts like, if I remember correctly, it casts like three fifths of the vote in the district. So, so if she does well there this time around, she's a sure bet for re-election. And she may also, it's not out of the question that she also wins um, Dallas County. So, um, if she wins Dallas, she's a sure bet for re-election. Yeah. If anyone the supposed to... reason that the third, yeah, the supposed reason that the third leans more Republican than the others is that it did better for Romney in 2012 than the other ones did. The problem was, but it was actually the least good for Trump of the districts that he won. It was he only won at 48 to 45 as compared to 49 to 45 for one and two. So really, that mm -hmm. was more of a residual from 2012. Is the idea that this is a more competitive district on paper. But it just didn't experience the same swing. Wild. I mean, it was the other ones where I believe forty Obama got fifty six percent of the vote in them. And they it, weren't remotely close. And so that was congressional a results as well have have fueled the perception that one is bluer than than three because in, before they both flipped in twenty eighteen, back in twenty fourteen and twenty sixteen, one was more competitive than three. Democrats lost it by a smaller margin. So that's that also fuels that perception. I believe. Yeah. yeah, but long I term, I don't think that's viable. Um, yeah. I mentioned yeah. Howard County. I mentioned Howard County earlier in 2018. Um, looks like Finkenauer lost it by like nine points. So that's part of the problem that she faces is like, you know, some of those Obama, you know, this is an Obama Trump district. Um, you know, a lot of those Ob Obama Trump counties are not coming back. Like, you know, that's the reality. So because mm -hmm. Trump did win Iowa by 10 percentage points. So, yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. really, really, it's a thing he should hope to win this time. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But um, yeah. Iowa itself yeah. is, um, Iowa itself, looking at the bigger picture, Iowa itself is probably going to be um, one of them. I think it's going to be competitive because it's not the most expensive battleground state, like states like North Carolina or, um, you know, Georgia. Like, those are expensive states. Iowa is not an expensive state. So, and uh, to add on what Niles was saying about the third district and how the Democrats essentially just have to put up a strong margin in Polk County, if you just look at the comparison between 2016, uh, the congressional race there in 2018, Jim Moore in his race against Young in 2016, he won Polk by 0.1 percent and Axney won it by 16 percent and Axney won. So that mm -hmm. basically sums it up. Yeah, yeah. we actually had a uh, we actually had a comment from uh, from Jackson uh, Bryman in the chat. He mentioned that Dallas County was one of only two counties to vote left in 2016 for, for uh, the president, other than uh, than Johnson County. Um, 
thought that was, and also he was saying to stop saying he won. He was also telling me to stop saying he won Iowa by ten percent. It was only nine point four percent, not ten percent. So. But yeah, I think the Iowa <laughs> seats. I think they're all good. I think I echo what everyone said. I think uh, Henson uh, and one is probably one of the best recruits Republicans have gotten in the entire country. Uh, with what she's been able to, mm -hmm. like when you uh, been able to do. Mm -hmm. uh, like when you look at other congressional, you know, Republican candidates this cycle, like Ashley Henson and Mike Garcia, um, they're definitely on the higher tier of candidates. Than and you got people like Ted Howes, Greg Ratz, Sean, uh, like Ted <laughs> Howes. Oh God! But I think with King, you went on person, you went on person in order. But I think uh, with King's primary, Joe actually, Ray Perkins. Yeah, I think it'll be <laughs> tight. Um, my guess, I think he just barely loses in the end. I think there. Uh, the anti-King vote inevitably consolidates, and I think, ideally, uh, I think Republicans in Washington would like to get rid of King. Uh, I mean, Steve Silvers, the chairman of the Republican Steering Committee, basically, I think, said that he doesn't want to give King any assignment if under any power he has. So I think, I would say right now, King's slightly going to lose, but who knows with that race. I think I agree with what was said about three. Uh, Polk County will probably power. Um, oh God, I'm, I'm having a brain fart with her name. Um, Act, the Act, the Act, Act, thank you. To a win again, probably, and just the, the characteristics are there. And I think two, two will be, I think, close. But I think that's probably going to be a fundamentals race of which candidate in the end they are is nominate. If it's Meeks, I think they have a better chance of winning. If it's Schilling, it's probably going to be an easy Democratic win. And, since and that's only because of fundraising. Yeah. Technically, Schilling has more experience because he's been in Congress, but as a congressional loser who lost his seat to boost us in 2012, it's not going to yeah. play well. Well, yeah. And uh, I think, as you noted, people don't like uh, carpetbaggers running in their seat, especially someone who's running in the state. And Meeks has lost that district or an iteration of it twice at this point. Yeah. So neither yeah. candidate. Be, yeah. And, uh, Rita be Hart's fair, win. I'd be very yeah. shocked. If Rita Hart lost, that would be a huge upset. To be fair to Schilling, I think he was drawn out of his seat, really. It was drawn to be as Democratic as possible. Um, yeah, so, that. I mean, that, that's not much salt. I mean, you should, it's a, I mean, it's a district. I mean, that, it's, that played it's, Illinois it's, in general that year. I mean, you had Biggert and Walsh also fall victim to that and lose seats that were drawn to be favorable for the Democrats. Yeah, you had the, the Madigan mandate that was passed by the <laughs> legislature. <laughs> hey, I'm going, back to, um, going back to Iowa, um, looking, you know, beyond the politics of of it. Um, Cindy Axony is actually, I think she's a pretty strong incumbent. Like, I think she's held more town halls than any of the freshman Democrats. I could be, yeah, I think she has held more town halls than any of any of the other um, freshman Democrats. So she's very, um, I think she's very accessible to her district. Um, yeah. And, and, you know, that plays well. In, she's a raw in good political states. talent. Yeah, yeah, and if you if you just look at the state of Iowa in general, I mean, if you compare them to some of these other Rust Belt states with districts, Iowa's unique in the fact that two out of the four, you could argue three out of the four districts are going to be very competitive. Because if you look at states like Illinois, for example, or Michigan, Slotkin and Stevens are both favorites for re-election, especially Stevens because of poor recruitment and their mm -hmm. opponents. Same with Sean Caston against Gene Ives. And to some extent, Lauren Underwood is in a lean Democratic race against Oberweiss, where she's the favorite. And Minnesota, Dean Phillips, and Angie Craig are both in strong, both have strong shots at re-election. I mean, Phillips is a safe Democratic seat at this point. Yeah, that seat's gone. For the hours. So Iowa is really the heart of competitiveness, I think. Yeah. yeah. Um, in the so Rust Minnesota, Belt. Um, Minnesota, now that we're on the topic, Minnesota, and I'm, I'm assuming that next we'll go to Illinois because there's a lot I want to say about Illinois. Um, but Minnesota, um, <laughs> I do I do believe that um, – that Colin Peterson, this is going to be his closest race probably ever, yeah. um, because you know he's never faced an opponent like um, Fishbach. But you have to give him credit. The fact that he's held on for this long is amazing in and of itself. Like um, mm -hmm. you know, I, I don't, I can't remember the last time a Democratic presidential candidate carried Peterson's district. I think it was like Bill Clinton. And I think yeah, ninety six. Yeah. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. but, um, but um, you have to give him credit. The fact that he has held on this long is amazing in and of itself. Um, yeah. But I do think he will yeah. outrun Biden by a lot, like he always does. He always outruns the Democratic presidential nominee. Um, but, you know, his margin has gradually decreased over the years. And even in 2018, he did uh, slightly worse than he did in 2016, I believe. So, mm -hmm. yeah. 
I guess well, it's garbage. This is certainly going to be his toughest race by far. Fishbach right. could win, but another thing to bring up is if Fishbach does win, redistricting will definitely not suit her well when she ends up having to primary <laughs> stop or Yeah. Yes, yeah. yeah. it's Tom Emmer or Tom Emmer. She's or in the sixth district Tom candidate. Who knows where they yeah, draw? Yeah, Tom Emmer. Yeah, Tom. Yeah, Emmer. like if she's in um, a primary with Tom Emmer, that's like you know, Tom Emmer would be the easy favorite. That says, of course, another decides to run for governor, of course. In this another area. seat to look at for sure in uh, Minnesota was one of the closest house races in 2018. It's a rematch race between Dan Feehan and Jim Hagedorn. And in a presidential year, yeah. Hagedorn is the favorite. But if you guys are curious to see what you guys think about Feehan's chances these, this time around. Um, yeah, so I mean, um, um, I'll start up. That's okay. I'd like to start off. Um, in the first district, um, Hagedorn is not really a strong incumbent like he ran like two or three times previously and you know he finally won in 2018 in, in an open seat yeah. race but um you know and he's not the best fundraiser and i think um you know this is tim walls's old district i can i can see him out there campaigning for dan fia because i'm pretty sure that um he's he's still popular in the first district tim walls yeah but he won while walls was winning the district yeah. anyway yeah i mean yeah. Yeah. yeah, so that, I mean that's already a benefit he had. I mean, it, it is um, it is curious to see. I mean, had Walls and Nolan run for re-election, could they have managed to hold the seats? I mean, I think Walls would have been able to beat Hagedorn and had he run in twenty eighteen. I think the eighth would have been tougher, but yeah, I, I agree. Um, I want to go in, in Minnesota a little bit because I wrote an article about it earlier this week. It was about the fifth district, but there are some uh, prevailing trends. Uh, the first district is one that I believe is going to remain in Republican hands, both on the presidential. Um, and the congressional level. I mean, Trump won it by around 15 points back in 2016. There's no doubt that he's capable of winning it again. But if you look at the counties in the district, um, obviously, uh, Olmstead County is a, is a county that's going to be more democratic with Rochester and uh, the highly educated populace there, uh, but also Blue Earth County and Nicolette County, which very, narrow, very narrowly went to Trump. I believe that uh, it's potentially likely that Biden is able to win them back and, and by a good few points. Uh, but I think that overall, uh, Trump is going to be able to win the district again. I also want to quickly go over to the 8th district, uh, which is especially interesting. Not because, um, yeah, up there um, with Duluth being an the anchor of that, uh, sort of encompassing the Iron Range of Minnesota. It's especially interesting because even back as recently as 2014, with Al Franken's re-election bid, he, uh, he lost the 3rd district, which is now pretty solidly Democratic uh, with Dean Phillips, but he managed to win the 8th district. And along with the fourth and the fifth district, the eighth district has historically been the most or one of the most democratic mm -hmm. districts in Minnesota. Uh, very, very, very working class, very blue collar. Uh, but since Trump, since sorry, since Trump basically won it in 2016, uh, Republicans have had a pretty good showing there. Uh, and with Pete Stauber winning it in 2018, it doesn't look like Democrats are going to have a good opportunity to take it back this year. And so I yeah. think, at least in my opinion, actually, actually, I have a, I have a map for Minnesota. A. That's interesting. Oh, great. Oh, go yeah. ahead. Sorry yeah. to interrupt. I think Stauber's safe, well, you, actually. I wanted, he yeah. outran um, the, the governor candidate and the oh, yeah, about a lot. Both out, yeah. yeah, both he ran, he outran them, but, but they both also won the district. I mean, the, I think the interesting thing with Minnesota is I think you've seen a tale of two states. You see these rural formerly Democratic seats trending very heavily away from them. But then you see these former suburban R seats like Paulson's old seat and uh, Minnesota, I think two it is, uh, which were both R held seats also moving away. So I think it's an, an interesting case for a state that is, you know, competitive, but, you know, moving in different directions. I think back to Peterson, uh, I mean, he has lasted a long time, but I do think this is he, this is almost likely the tough. This will be the, the toughest race of his career, and possibly the last one. I just, I don't know how much longer he could probably hold off the trends from inevitably catching up with him. I mean, now having the House Agriculture Committee is a powerful tool to ha possibly get one last push, and there's a lot to be said. I think Fischerbach is a good candidate, but you know, there's one thing: being a good candidate and then being on the actual pressure of having to win a seat. Mm -hmm. But the thing for me is that Fishbach is outraising Colin well, Peters. Significant. Not something that's not saying a lot. He's a good candidate. Um, We're not saying he's a bad lot. candidate. This is a cheap yeah. district. It's a cheap district, and um, you know, Colin Peterson has always been, you know, this cranky old man who doesn't campaign, doesn't fundraise. So that's always, you know, that's always been who he is. Like, you know, he's 
you know, he's that's his brand. Like, you know, just, well, yes, but the issue. The question is if he can actually campaign and if he can actually fundraise. That's what yeah, we're that, gonna have to figure yeah. out. That's the issue. I mean, it's going to be I mean, tougher yeah. against Fishbot considering Dave Hughes was his opponent in the last three yeah, elections. Yeah. I mean, I mean, you saw Here, Dave Hughes, me, uh, yeah, Eric Paulson in the third district. He got 56 or 57 percent of the vote in 2016, and then he just got demolished by Dean Phillips. Because yeah, um, yeah, I mean, you could. I don't think that's going to happen. I think it's going to be a close race, but it's I right, think it's very really likely that it flips the seventh. Yeah, um, um, I wanted to show. Want to add, add the map up if you have it, Harry or Harrison. Yeah, yeah, I was just going to uh, – hold on. Here it is. The infinite yes. window. So <laughs> Minnesota, yeah, Minnesota 8 was one of the most interesting seats to look at because it's a different iron range. And John Cuvion said this in my comments, but it's, a, it's not your parents' iron range. And it's really mm -hmm. very applicable to this district because if you look at it back in 2010, Jim Oberstar lost in a huge upset to Chip Kravak. And uh, – Kravak ended up losing in 2012, and that was considered a fluke race. So it was almost like a Kendra Horn style victory for Kravak, and then he was gone. But had, but then if you look at 2014, Nolan managed to win the district against Mills, uh, who his opponent, who was his opponent twice, and that was a red wave. And mm -hmm. the fact that I just thought it was incredibly interesting that Nolan was able to hold the seat in a huge red wave like 2014, but then a Republican of all parties flipped it in a blue wave in 2018. That just shows you how in the Trump era it continues to trend for the Republicans. And you can just see that expanding support on the map, particularly in the uh, southwestern region of the district. It's getting redder and the coalition is expanding. So I just think Minnesota's 8th district is one of those districts that's just continuing to trend away from Democrats. And I thought the fact that it voted opposite of the national part, uh, national environment in both those elections was a very interesting trend. Yeah, and Stubborn yeah. himself was a fantastic choice for that seat in his you know, background, you know, you know, it was a very, you know, inspirational thing for many folks in that type of seat. And whatever happens with him, yeah, he's probably, you know, in a case, pushed that seat much more to uh, what ours could have never dreamed of in that seat almost a decade ago. Yeah, it is, it is a good thing for Republicans in a, in a pretty uh, bleak environment, I think. And mm -hmm. so I want to go back to your point about the 2014 election in that district. Uh, as I mentioned before, um, Al Franken was able to win the 8th district also in his Senate re-election campaign. But just to show you, just to sort of show the extent of how much things have changed in the in four years, uh, Keith Ellison, who, as you all know, is a highly controversial candidate, uh, he won the attorney general race back in 2018, and yeah. uh, you know McFadden, who is a Republican candidate in 2014, was able to win the third district uh, against an incumbent Democratic senator, but Keith Ellison, the Democrat, managed to win the third district back in, in 2018, uh, just as Dean Phillips was able to win by a huge margin. But no Republicans were able to win the district in, the, in any race. And even as bad as Keith Ellison was as a candidate, despite all of his controversies, uh, he still managed to win the third, which is pretty remarkable, at least in my opinion. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So right, I so think if, Niles if we're all good talk. on, yeah, if we're uh, all good I on, Niles Minnesota, wanted to talk about Illinois. Yeah, uh, let me pull up Illinois real quick then. Um, Illinois is definitely. It's a weird state because Republicans actually had a congressional majority as recently as 2010 before the Madigan mandate, um, if mm -hmm. I'm going to call it from now on. Um, so they've been competitive, you know, pretty in most of the districts of the state until it was redrawn and even after it was redrawn. They had a pretty good congressional presence yeah. in that area. 2012 was honestly a very large bloodbath for Illinois Republicans coming out of that cycle. I mean, Bobby Schilling, Judy Biggert, and Joe Walsh are all lost. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm going to zoom into upstate because, frankly, that's basically the only area that matters aside from the 13th district. Um, mm -hmm. So all this mess in the Northeast is um, is Madigan's work. And so try and make if – you, if you have difficulty seeing what the districts are, you're not alone. They, <laughs> they're kind of – they're drawn the way they are. That's just how I'm it is. even better at the next redistricting cycle. <laughs> oh, God. I mean, just the way they're going, if you look at it, 10 used to be competitive when you had Bob Dold and Brad Schneider fighting it out. But now 10 uh, is pretty stably in the Democratic column. 11 and 8 have been in the Democratic column since Bigger and Walsh lost. And now with someone like Gene Ives running against Kasten, that seat's in the same same house, essentially. Which one, Kasten? No, I hate to interject, but District 10, like the only, Brad Schneider's only vulnerability is a Democratic primary. And in a district like that, his style of politics, you know, I think it plays well in a, in a district like that. 
So I can't mm-hmm. see him being too vulnerable in a primary. Yeah, I mean, he's one of the more moderate members of the House, if yeah. I recall, right? Yeah, very moderate. They went, from a, they went from the most moderate Republican to one of the most moderate Democrats. They just like having moderate people who don't want to raise their taxes too yeah. much. Mm-hmm. They don't care what the party is too much. <laughs> yeah, going to um, Illinois 14, um, you know, Lauren Underwood, she um, flipped She flipped Illinois 14th and... Um, 2018. Um, you know, you know. Before I get into what I wanted to say, um, I actually met Lauren Underwood in 2018 when she was in Atlanta for some, um, for a Democratic Party conference, I believe that I had the opportunity to attend, and she was there. I hate that I didn't get a picture with her, but she was there, <laughs> and you know, I was glad <laughs> to admit. Um, you know, at the time, you know, that race wasn't really on the radar. Like, you know, this, you know, Illinois 14 really didn't come on on the radar to like October ish, but um, yeah. anyway. Um, Illinois 14, Lauren Underwood is interesting because she has a, I think she's one of the most liberal members of the freshman class in, in swing mm-hmm. districts anyway. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think she's GovTrack had, most- her, GovTrack had her as, as one of, if not the most reliable liberal votes in the House for quite a while. Yeah. I think but, she's but just moderated that, a little bit. But to that and point. Bit, I mean, she's in the 40s or 50s instead of in, you know, the top 20. Yeah. But to that point, um, to that point, um, Trump still won this district. Um, I don't think he's going to do so this year, but um, he won it in 2016 by about like four points, I believe, like 49, 45, something like that. Mm-hmm. He and, did win um, it. The- I can, yeah, it was 49, mm-hmm. 45. It was down about uh, 54 to 44, I believe, for Mitt Romney, I think. Yeah, yeah. He, he did worse than Romney, I think, in the, in the Chicago Land burbs, from what I remember yeah. reading. Um, yeah, that yeah, 15 and 16 were drawn as vote votes. Fifteen and yeah. sixteen, or fourteen and 15, sixteen, were drawn as vote sync. They were supposed to be Republican areas where all the Republicans were packed into. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. So the anyway. fourteen backfired basically, like many Republican gerrymanders in twenty eighteen, or in this case, a Democratic. Except it wasn't a Republican. Yeah. 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 I, yeah. So in, a way, in a way, in a way, the Illinois congressional map was kind of like a bipartisan compromise in the sense that, like you know, okay. Illinois Democrats will get everything downstate, but we'll give Republicans something in the suburbs. You know. I mean, I know that's a good point, but a lot of Republicans would still be upset because obviously District 11 and District 8 and District 17 were also held by Republicans before the gerrymander was put into place. But mm-hmm. but I actually agree with your point largely. I mean, no one saw 14 and 6 essentially trending that far to the Democrats and defeating Peter Roskam and Randy Holtgren. I mean, Roskam used to win re-election with nearly 70 percent of the vote early in his career. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a bipartisan map in the same sense Pennsylvania was, which is basically the Republicans are like, we're going to draw the map. You're going to get hosed, but we'll give you a couple seats to make you reasonably all right, and we'll make the holding seat more liberal, so you actually get a liberal there. Like, it, it, it's kind of in the same sense as that. But I don't think any any Democrats are happy with Pennsylvania, and I don't think a ton of Republicans were happy with, with Illinois, aside no, from having and then, and, and then Holden lost his primary. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> um, anyway, Illinois 14. Um, like I said, um, Lauren Underwood, she's proven to be a mostly party line vote. But Trump still won this district, which is why I find it interesting that Republicans decided to go with Jim Oberweiss. And, you know, I'm kind of surprised <laughs> really that no credible Republicans decided to run. Like, you know, like I said, like this, I don't think Trump was going to win this district in 2020, but he did win it in 2016. So the fact that Lauren Underwood has maintained a pretty party line voting record, despite the fact that Trump won this district, is re- not only is that amazing, but the fact that Republicans couldn't field a strong challenger there is amazing in and of itself. So, yeah. yes, Republicans yeah. struggled very much to mount credible candidates in six and fourteen. I mean, yeah. Sue Rezin was the establishment pick in fourteen and lost to Oberweiss in the sixth district. Obviously, Gene Ives. Ever since Evelyn Sanguinetti dropped out, Gene Ives was the presumptive there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, she's yeah. just a disaster yeah. of a candidate. Yeah, Gene Ives is a train wreck. <laughs> Yeah, six, six is a safe seat. In fact, many pundits are probably going to end up moving it from likely to safe by yeah. the fall. That's possible. Mm. And, and the fact and that she's going, going a little downstate to Illinois 13. Um, mm-hmm. Very well, that interesting. One, race. Yeah, that one. That one was actually one of those seats that Madigan wanted to be a you know Democratic vote sink, and they have not held it at all this decade. So, <laughs> but yeah. um, anyway, anyway. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, this time around, you have um, a, you're going to have a rematch of 2018. You had um, um, Betsy Dirksen Lundgren, who, who used to be a um, fundraiser, I believe, for Dick Durbin. 
Um, she's running against um, Rodney Davis, who is one of the quieter Republicans in the caucus and in, in the House. You know, the, the ones in um, swing districts. Anyway, he's definitely one of the one of the more quieter ones. Um, but um, I think you know it's going to be interesting to see if you know because you know this is a college district. It'll be interesting to see if if colleges are not back in session in November by November, like you know, like okay, what is that going to do with with um, mm -hmm. with Logan's coalition? So that's just one of the thoughts that I had. But anyway, yeah, if she can win the seat, then reasonably Schumer can just go, okay, we're just going to make give Mike Boss the safe seat, you know, split downstate up so they give St. Clair and some of the other more Democratic areas to the thirteenth basically make a Demo an actual Democratic vote sync that actually works if you can stretch it from, from that because, area to a couple other ones. Yeah, not to, I hate to um, interrupt as well, but, but Illinois is scheduled to, to lose a seat in redistricting. So you've got the 15th, Mary Miller is the Republican nominee there. So she's going to have at least one term in Congress. But what do you guys think is going to end up happening in redistricting? Do you think Boast and Miller are going to end up in a primary for one of the safe vote sync, uh, safe Republican vote sync seats probably, down here when they read probably. auto maps? Mm -hmm. I'm just on the 15th and the 12th, to be honest, because the, the 15th is just all the Republican parts. And, I mean, it's just a complete and total vote sink right now. Where is Where does um, Rodney Davis live? Uh, he, lives look it up Taylor, Taylorville. he lives in Taylorville, which is in, uh, in Christian County. Mm. So that's right in the center of the 13th district, right next to Springfield. Mm. And I'm pretty sure Londrigan is from Springfield, so... Anyway, yeah, to, I, mean, I, can see the, I can see them drawing a safer Democratic 13th district for sure. Yeah. The tricky thing with Illinois is, is it's the land of the ticket splitters. It's, I mean, if you compare the Senate, and I, I've tried to draw maps there personally. I've drawn a two, two like incredibly Trump favorable seats downstate, and yet one of them votes almost for um, for the Democratic candidate uh, Tammy uh, Duckworth. Um, it's it's hard to be. 100% certain with any map you draw there because there is a there is a large number of voters who are just comfortable with splitting their tickets for a whatever reason for any number of candidates. Mm. But anyway, um, to that point though, to my earlier point, um, um, I think this will be a competitive competitive race. Um, you know, it's definitely one of the. Um, it's not a it's not a high on the Democrats' list of pickup opportunities because it's not an open seat. Like you know, you have several open seats that are um, you know like low hanging fruit at this point for Democrats. You have like Texas 23, um, Georgia seven, um, Texas 24, Texas 22. Like, so, you know, you have a lot of open seats, you know, open Republican held seats that they're going to be um, spending more time targeting. I don't think they're going to be targeting Illinois 13 as much as they'll be targeting a district like Texas 23, even though the, that's looking like a, a near certain pickup. Like, you know, I think they'll still I think they'll still play, um, be um, competing there quite a bit. There's one more thing that I wanted to bring up before we go to Michigan, and it's actually something that Niles talks about frequently, and it's Missouri's second district across the river from the 13th. Mm -hmm. It's another seat a lot like that, but I honestly think that Jill Shupp will end up She's, I think Jill Shupp is going to be a better candidate this cycle than Betsy Dirksen Lodrigan, but if you guys want to elaborate on that, just you don't really have to pull up the Missouri map, but it, and Wagner's seat. Should be a competitive race this cycle yeah. again, even though it's the I mean, it's it definitely could because um, if you actually look back at 2014, uh, Jill Shupp was one of the few legislative victories for Democrats. So she has been mm -hmm. going into this race. Uh, and Ben Oshman was a was a pretty good candidate from what I can recall. Uh, but this is a district that is, again, like a lot of other districts, moving to the left. It's very uh, well educated. And so I think a person like Jill Shupp, who can appeal to those audiences and also has a track record of appealing to the right audiences in very unfavorable years, I think that she has a, a really good shot at it. Yeah, she's a good and, candidate, I see. So I will say. I think, um, looking at um, 2000, oh, oh, anyway, 2012, um, this was actually one of few districts, I believe, where McCaskill did better from 2012 to 2018, um, you know, the second district. So. Um, I believe she wanted, you know, Miles made a um, map of the uh, Missouri Center race. Let me see if I can find it. Yeah, I know she won it, but I think, like I said, Galloway also carried it. Yeah, yeah. Um, but like I, like I mentioned, this is one of um, this is one of few districts where McCaskill did better than she did in 2012. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah. let's see. Um, 
in 2012, she won. Um, so in 2012, McCaskill won the second district, 52 to 43. In um, oh wait, as a matter of fact, she didn't do better. Oh, my mistake. <laughs> my, my mistake. My mistake. I got. I got her race was pretty bad, though. I mean, for Tyler, wait, I, yeah. wait, what she get? It What'd was she, uh, she, still, she. She still wanted it. Was fifty. It was fifty to um forty eight. But to but to my point, um, you know, it, forgive me. That was you know I I remembered incorrectly. So um, <laughs> excuse me. Excuse me for that. Anyway, um, the second district is one of those districts that are that are you know is similar to the types of districts that Democrats have been doing well in lately. Like um, you know, suburban, college educated, wealthy. You know, those are the types of districts where um, Democrats have been doing well. So I think, um, like, 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 like it was like, um, like you guys mentioned, Joe Shub, she's definitely a better candidate than Van Ostrin. Um, you know, and she's actually um, like, like, um, like, you, like, like was mentioned, she was one of the few, um, you know, legislative pickups for Democrats in 2018 in terms of state legislatures. She was one of the few. Um, Democrats to flip a seat in the state legislature, so that's definitely an asset. Um, so because she's so because she's proven that she can win in tough environments. Um, but the second district, I do believe it's going to be one of the quieter races. Like I said, like Illinois 13, it's not an open seat, so I don't think Democrats will be. It will be high on their. Will, I don't think it will be high on their list of targets, like mm -hmm. you know districts like Georgia 7 or Texas 23. And I think with Michigan, uh, Missouri second, I think uh, from what it said, Wagner got the wake up call with that from, you know, only from as someone I've talked with who knows her campaign a little well, you know, she took the memo that the seat is no longer um, safe. So I think unlike many Republicans, who I think failed to realize that their seats are not the same things they once inherited. I think Wagner will put up, you know, a very, you know, big fight and whether she wins it or not, I think, you know, she, understands the situation and gravity of where her seat is heading towards. Yeah, I think Ann Wagner is one of the few Republicans who actually pays attention to, you know, the bigger picture, um, which is why I, which is why I find it interesting that she was not chosen for the um, NRCC chair position because uh, Tom Emmer, he's from a safe seat. Mm -hmm. um, like um, Ann Wagner, she knows what's happening in the suburbs firsthand. Like she's witnessing it before her very eyes. Um, but, um, Ann Wagner's next cycle. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, if we can defeat the redistricting thing, which I'm not even sure it's legal, what the amendment that was passed is legal. It seems to mandate to me they have spaghetti string districts, which I just don't think mm -hmm. is viable, but she has to hope she can survive that and get to a point of, you know, relevance at that point. Yeah. She entered the, she, she didn't make up her mind in time and Josh Hawley was already in the race. So it was too late. Yeah, I was going to mention that. Like, 2018, like she was actually gearing up to run for Senate. Like mm -hmm. she was actually uh, lining up staffers, um, going out and doing polls. Like she was actively gearing up to run against McCaskill. But um, like Harrison said, Josh Hawley entered the race before before she could, and you know, you know, they practically rolled out the red carpet for him. So, mm -hmm. gotcha. I think you know, I think yeah. um, I think that was definitely a missed opportunity for. Republicans. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd much rather have Ann Wagner there than the, than Josh Hawley, and I think a lot of Republicans would would rather have that right now. Mm -hmm. so anyway, I will anyway, to run for a Blunt seat if Blunt decides to retire in uh, twenty two. Yeah. Um, Vicky yeah. Hartzler is a possibility because she's from a safe seat. Anyway, mm -hmm. going on to Michigan. Um, It's an interesting no, Michigan, Michigan 8 and 11 are a lot like Illinois 14 and 6, mm -hmm. and the Republicans, once again, have very poor recruitments. Yeah, there's really not much to talk about in Michigan in terms yeah. of house races, but... Um, <laughs> it's a very but, mathematical um, gerrymander. Yeah, I mean, re Republicans, the, you know, the 11th district was drawn to be, and I'm pretty sure the 8th district was too, they were both drawn to be Republican vote sinks, and look how that turned yeah, out. Yeah, it's kind of turned into a dummy mander. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. And you think yeah. they would have a better candidate. They have to be kicking themselves they don't have a better candidate against um um uh, what's her name? Haley Haley Stevens, given some of the outbursts she's had, you would think they would have at least had someone competent to go against her, but apparently not. Well that um, district's trending far away for Republicans long term and Haley Stevens is a strong incumbent. Like you know, like um you know, in a way I think I, I see that district similar um 
is, you know, so I put like districts like Mich Michigan 11, New York 19, like, you know, in, in Michigan 8 for that matter, um, winnable districts on paper for Republicans, but they like dropped the ball on recruiting. So, <laughs> mm -hmm. and they all voted for Trump. Michigan 8, 11, and New York 19, they all voted for yeah. Trump. Yeah, As a well, I can trend it towards Trump. Yeah, it trended towards him. Yeah, anyway, um, they all voted for Trump and Republicans, like, you know, they've recruited like no one in any of those districts. Like, um, and and it's it's just fascinating to me how they've like dropped the ball on so many of these winnable districts. My honest theory is that they are waiting on 2022 because you know they 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 believe that um that a Biden is going to win and they'll have you know that'll be a better opportunity for them to make gains in the house. But that's just my honest theory. But well, and the new map itself is going to be you know confusing for both parties because certain people might get you know drawn into seats they didn't expect to get in. I think what is it? Yeah, because Michigan's losing a seat. Yeah. Yeah, and Michigan yeah. eight for Michigan eight is interesting because on a fair map. Michigan eight will not stretch from Ingham County to Oakland County <laughs> on a fair map. And that's the red right part of Oakland County. That's like Plus, deep blood red Oakland County area. That's not the moderate portion. Mm -hmm. um, it's, and it's and uh, Slotkin actually lives in Oakland County. So she's probably going to have huh. to end up running in a seat. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it depends so on how they redraw the map and who ends up against who when Michigan loses a seat. But I mean, it, it really depends on who wow. takes the Michigan legislature this, this year, because if somehow Democrats pulled off a miracle and took it, then, I mean, I, I don't know the specifics for how Michigan does its redistricting, if they have a commission or if it's legislative yeah, with veto power. They have a commission now. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a weird commission. Never mind then. Weird commission. then my, point, yeah. my point doesn't make sense then. I was just you know, for it's sure. Right. About the it's a weird commission. Um, yeah. It's a new experiment for both parties now in Michigan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to I your like point, the commission better than Arizona. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> what, yeah, what are you saying, Niles? To your point about the legislature, um, the state senate is not up this year. It's only the state house. The state senate yeah. is up every four years. But anyway, yeah. Um, yeah, it's it's one of those. Like I said, Michigan eight, the Michigan house eleven. Competitive races, though. Yeah, mm -hmm. Michigan so, eight, uh, Michigan winnable districts on paper, but Republicans are not re recruiting strong candidates. So, sums up the, a lot of Republican recruitment in this whole cycle in general. That could sum it up. Yeah, mm -hmm. like I said, my theory is that they're waiting on you know 2022 because they don't think Trump is going to be president by then. Like, you know, I, I don't know if that's I, like that's just a theory of mine. So I think that's a reasonable theory, but Tom Emmer should at least be thinking, well, maybe if we can flip more Democratic seats in 2020, we'd have an even stronger standing point for 2022. Mm -hmm. But he's yeah, not thinking that way. Yeah, mm -hmm. if it's yeah, like in, if it's party of yeah. You, you think the movement of people, the but he fights part of the party, would be like, hey, maybe we should, you know, fight for at least some of these seats. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, yeah, it would put them in a better spot for a red wave here because they'd already have more seats, even in a minority, even mm -hmm. if they're a minority, which they will be. There was an yeah. article a little bit a few days ago. I mean, who knows exactly how valid it is, but it was of the Trump campaign asking mem Republican House members to um, help raise money. <laughs> for his campaign and a lot of them apparently balked at it because it's like we don't we're not getting any resources from you and like you know you i mean yeah. it's from what um i think i think niles you said this um or somebody somebody else has, i mean i read it in the news too just the fact that the trump campaign is raising you know dra a dragon horde of money and then down yeah. down it's just the fundraising is just not really, I mean, even now with the Senate, which is shocking because, you know, I looked at the map um, after 2018 for the Senate and I'm like, it's good, but it's not great. But now, I mean, things are going, I mean, obviously there's so much, there's so much that could change, but, you know, but now things are, you know, becoming more of a competitive um, dog fight. So. And to your yeah. point, like you said, um, Trump is raising, you know, millions and millions of dollars while down ballot Republicans are struggling to raise money. And then with Democrats, um, Biden is struggling to raise money, but down ballot Democrats are, you know, hoarding all of the money. Yeah, it's um, inverse. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, poor Amy yeah. McGrath, Amy it's McGrath bad. is running a grifter machine right now. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, I've actually seen, to your point, I've seen her ads on TV, and I live in Atlanta, and I'm seeing her ads on TV. Like, what? <laughs> <laughs> I, I just honestly, it's not going to happen. I know it's not going to happen. I'll just preference it by saying that. But if McGrath somehow lost her Democratic primary, I would probably get a laugh out of that. 
Yeah, like all that <laughs> money. And all money. that money wasted. <laughs> Turns out spending money outside of Kentucky for a Kentucky race is a pretty bad idea if you want to win Kentucky. Yeah, that's true. Anyway, also on to the Democrat in general. On yeah, the Indiana um, five, I guess. Looking at yeah. Michigan, um, I guess the only potential Democratic flip would be let me see. Or the, the state? State. it's the sixth. Yeah, it's the sixth. Is I think John Hoadley's running there, but there is an internal showing him ahead, but I don't really give that poll very much credence because there's so much undecided. Yeah, that and Fred Upton is the kind of guy who's going to hold that seat until he dies. Yeah, if, if he didn't so. lose in 2018, he's not going to lose in 2020. And I know a lot of people hate that argument, but it's true for that mm -hmm. seat. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So but let's also, talk. I know um, Pete really want, yeah, I know Robert really wanted to talk about the 5th District in Indiana, so let's give him a little bit to, because it is an interesting right. area. Yeah, it's an interesting seat just because of uh, what's her face. Season Brooks, who held the seat uh, the last few years, decided to retire out of nowhere, uh, with the shock to a lot of people. Uh, and so far, the Republican primary in that seat has been a bit of a, a mess. Hard, uh, <laughs> crash in a bit. Uh, with you know, Joy Mitchell, Mitchell. Yeah, Joy Mitchell uh, not supposed, you know, not doing well. Uh, and now you have a state senator who really no one had on the radar now possibly winning that seat. Uh, I think from, she's a Ukrainian immigrant. I forget, I'm forgetting her name, but Victoria Smarts. <laughs> yeah, Victoria Smarts. Thank you. So, yeah, I mean, the primary there is quite fascinating. I mean, on the Democratic side, you have a respectable candidate. Uh, they have it's just a question of, you yeah, know, Christina Hale. Hale. I don't think the seat's going to flip, but I think it's interesting to see how much the margin. And that seat is, I mean, Hamilton County, for example, is getting less uh, read by uh, every passing election. I think Kratz the other day had an article about uh, the county itself, you know, how less read it's been getting. I think only Don Lee did much better in Hamilton than he did in uh, 2012. Mm -hmm. It's the only county in Indiana that trended left from 2008. Yeah. yeah. Every other mm -hmm. county in the state trended towards Donald Trump except for Hamilton County. And that's because yeah. of the growth in Caramel and, mm -hmm. and just it's just a massive suburban county. It has the most it has the if Republicans wanted to draw five today, they would not draw the north part of Hamilton. They'd draw or, uh, Marion, they draw the south part of Marion. Oh yeah. Um, and because because the northern part's just getting more democratic. Mm -hmm. It's it's gonna be easy to fix the situation in redistricting, but it's not what you want right now. This is kind of off topic, but just a brief little synthesis here. I mean, looking at the region surrounding the Indianapolis suburbs in the southern half of the 5th District, it's definitely a district or a region of Indiana, I suppose, one of the only regions in Indiana that's going to trend towards the Democrats over the next decade. I mean, you have Vigo County, for example, narrowly voted for Donnelly, has a history of being that presidential bellwether county, but 2020, especially if Biden wins, will break that trend, and it just shows you how much Indiana is really trending away. I mean, Brad Ellsworth... There was a point where you had Baron Hill, Brad Ellsworth, and Joe Donnelly all representing seats in the southern part of the state, the 8th District and the 2nd District. Now they're all held by Republicans by solid margins. So yeah. Indiana. Yeah, Terre Haute's actually, yeah. My dad's actually from Terre Haute, so he's pretty from, he actually didn't realize it was a bellwether area. They don't seem to realize the national <laughs> view of, like, of Vigo County as this place you know, that matches the nation at this point. So, Not anymore. Yeah. Per se. I mean, and Marion, Marion used to be competitive. It was in 2006. I think Republicans may have actually won the House vote in Marion County because there was a competitive race in the urban, the 7th district. Because I know um, Bush won Marion in 04, and I think Daniels in 08 was the last star to carry it in the statewide race. Yeah. But uh, yeah, but it's just gone so far out yeah. of the... And, and for those who aren't familiar, it's Marion and Indianapolis are basically the same thing. There's a couple of independent locations inside of of Marion County, but it's a consolidated city county. So it's kind of, for most purposes, you just generally refer to them as kind of identical, unless you're referring mm -hmm. to one of the, the small the cities that are inside of it that, are, that have their own government, but aren't in the consolidation thing. Yeah. Mm. Um, going back yeah. to um, the Sorry. race in Indiana, um, going back to the race in Indiana five, um, you know, that Republican primary is interesting. I didn't think it would get that crowded. I thought that Susan Brooks would endorse somebody and she ended up not doing that. So, um, but you know, it's an interesting mixture of candidates. Like you have the state treasurer is running, but she, I'm surprised. I don't believe this has been brought up in the campaign. She doesn't live in the district. She doesn't. She lives in the seventh. <laughs> So um, I mean, it I'm didn't stop. That. It didn't stop Ann Kirkpatrick. So I don't think many people really end up caring. Well, in her defense, she actually did move. To, I think she actually did move to Tucson. To yeah, run. she did. But um, <laughs> anyway, um, <laughs> and then, um, 
Mm -hmm. And then you have the state senator, Victoria Sparts, running. She represents the part of the state that is, you know, trending away from Republicans. She represents Hamilton County. Um, but uh, Christina Hill, I think she's a really good candidate. In the, you know, in a way, she's kind of like Joe Shupp. Only she didn't flip. I don't believe she flipped a seat. But in 2014, she still won re-election. So, in yeah. in the state legislature. So that's pretty interesting. You know. She's also Christina Hill. She's also far outpacing the field in fundraising. Like um, Victoria Sparts, like you know, she raised like fifty five thousand dollars and loaned herself another seven hundred thousand. So, uh, we had someone in the chat mention. I don't know if anyone's familiar with the uh, the first district of Indiana, um, but it, it's an open seat. Uh, I believe the incumbent Democrat there, Vizlowski, yeah. uh, yeah. is hiring, and so yeah. Yeah, Thomas McDermott um, is, is the big Democrat there, although the former, I think, uh, former chief of staff for Visklowski or current chief of staff is also running, but I forget his name. So that'll... Visklowski endorsed somebody. He endorsed... He endorsed um, his, someone who used to work for him that's running against McDermott. Yeah, yeah. and you also and have... The, the most notable. You also have the... Um, the um, Democratic lead, one of the Democratic leaders in the legislature running. Um, her name is um, Con, uh, Can Candelaria. I, I can't pronounce her name, but she's the one of the Democratic leaders in the um, legislature. So, um, you know, she's a pretty credible candidate too. Yeah. Just another word on Indiana first is that I've heard people suggest that the district will be chopped up. I don't think it uh, will. I think it's more likely that they just they redraw the district to just include the most liberal parts of the second congressional as well. So like have it snake along northern Indiana to kind of grab any of the blue on um, the second district. You think they might try to stretch it to um from a uh, Gary to um South Bend or something like that? Yeah, I think because the, the the second district has been theoretically competitive in the past, right? They don't want someone like Pete Buttigieg to come in there and and try and mount a competitive challenge in that area. So what you could just do is since the, the, the southern counties, the district right now is drawn kind of a dummy mander. Because with the first district, you have it taking some of the two, uh, you have, I mean, it's the first, it's just a couple of areas up there. So what you could do is you could draw out the more conservative or right trending areas and put them into the fourth and second, and then just kind of take it over to South Bend, get the most liberal parts of that, that area out of the way. So if anyone wants to run from South Bend, they'd have to run in the Gary seat. Um, I, I just I think that'd be more viable because really the second is a little bit on paper it's just a little bit too competitive for my taste. Mm -hmm. um, Walorski shouldn't have any problems, but you know you can never be too careful um, at, at any level. Um, mm -hmm. But I think we've kind of exhausted the the Midwest at this point. Aside from a couple of <laughs> there's a couple we could do a couple races in Ohio, but really none of that's ultimately going to matter. Gonna Ohio doesn't anyway. really have any competitive races besides the first district. That gerrymander yeah. is still pretty effective. And Shabbat, Sh Sh Shabbat could be fine there. But uh, yeah. I think we have a little bit of time left. We can talk about some of the changes in the Senate races that have occurred. Yeah. Um, I know yeah. recently, yeah, the Georgia races in particular, I know Niles is probably dying to talk about the, the Georgia races because those are fascinating. Um, they've really been shifting beyond what people have been thinking could be done. Yeah, so um, if we're, I'll go into a little detail about the um, – about the races, let's start off with the race that everyone has been paying attention to, the special election, where you have, um, you know, Brian, you know, Johnny Isaacson, he res he resigned last year due to health issues, and um, and Brian Kemp, Governor Brian Kemp, decided to appoint Kelly Leffler, an Atlanta <laughs> businesswoman, to um, replace him, and she plans to pump millions of dollars into her own campaign, <laughs> and um, you know, you know. Um, a lot of you may remember Trump personally lobbied Kemp to appoint Doug Collins, and he, of course, mm -hmm. didn't do that. Um, and now Doug Collins is running for the seat anyway. Um, Democrats, for Democrats running in that seat, the um, the the um, preferred candidate among the Democratic establishment um, from people like Stacey Abrams and John Lewis is um, Raphael Warnock. He's the pastor at Ebenezer Baptist Church. That is the church where Martin Luther King used to preach with his father many years ago. So um, I'd in say Atlanta, that um, in Atlanta, the church is in Atlanta. Yeah, it's in Atlanta. It's in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. Anyway, um, that's pretty much where the state of things are. You know, that's pretty much who the candidates are. Like you also have some random Democrats running like a former U.S. attorney 
and you know Joe Lieberman's son. I don't think they're gonna go, they're gonna go far. But anyway, um, you know, of course Kelly Leffler has imploded. <laughs> like you know, she's only been in office, she's only been in office for a few months, and her her dis her unfavorable rating is already at like sixty percent. Like you know, I always I always had a feeling that she was going to have a hard time you know, getting her name out there because no one knew who she was. But now the people who do know who she is, they don't like her. <laughs> yeah, they know her as the person who sold stocks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. And even, if she's that's true, even if it's true or not that she didn't, did or did not know, that's what they know her as. Yeah, it's exactly. Hard to, yeah. It's hard to win back a first impression when your first impression is, hey, I may have committed a, a federal crime. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but anyway, yeah. shifting gears, um, shifting to the um, race, the regularly scheduled race where you have incumbent um, Republican David Perdue running for a um, running for a second term. Um, you know, on Democrats, there are there are, there are quite a few um, credible Democrats running. Um, you know, most most the most recognizable of all of them is um, John Ossoff, who of course ran in that um, high profile special election in the sixth district in 2017. He of course mm -hmm. lost. So he mad. of course lost. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still mad about that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I only donated like fifteen dollars, but I want my money back. A better congresswoman than uh, Ossoff would have been, and Handel's no longer in that seat. So at the end of the day, it yeah. turned out all right for Democrats. Oh, yeah, I think great. he finally great. lives there now and is married as a girlfriend. So that's two of the two of the attacks that Karen Handel had. Yeah, actually, um, you know, um, you know, I hate to get off topic, though. I found that argument to be dumb because John Ossoff, I know him personally. He grew up there. Yeah. Like he's been like you know, they, they tried to, you know, the Republicans during that campaign they tried to paint him as you know this this old San Francisco liberal Pelosi. Liberal. He grew up in Atlanta. He was born in Atlanta. He grew up in Atlanta. He's he he was working on campaigns when he was a child. Atlanta campaigns when he was a child. So he's been in Atlanta. He's he, he's not some California some California liberal. Like he's grew up in he grew up in Atlanta. He was born in Atlanta. So that attack was kind of dumb. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, aside from that, the other candidates in the race are, um, you know, Teresa Tomlinson. She's the former mayor of Columbus, a mid-sized city in um, in Southwest Georgia, which is getting pretty hard, which is getting hit pretty hard by the um, coronavirus. Um, and then you have um, Sarah Riggs Amico. She was the Democratic nominee for lieutenant governor in um, 2018, and. Um, you know, if you ask me, I think John Ossoff is going to win the nomination because he's raising money. He's um, got some really good endorsements from John Lewis to, um, you know, he's the only, to my knowledge, he's the only Democrat in the race with endorsements from members of the um, congressional delegation. So I think that's an asset. Um, you know, John Lewis is a very, very powerful figure. So mm -hmm. with reason, <laughs> with good reason. Yeah, with good reason, with good reason. And um, in, um, in you know in democratic primaries in georgia most of the vote is in atlanta and you know having john lewis's endorsement he represents atlanta so having john lewis's endorsement is probably going to bode really well for him in the end like you know we know he's going to in the primary he'll he's going to do well in the um in the sixth district because you know of course everyone in the sixth district knows who he is and um you know and i think having john lewis's endorsement is going to play really well in districts like the um like the fifth district. So, um, you know, so I think he's going to do really well in Metro Atlanta. I, I, you know, I can see Teresa Tomlinson doing well in districts like two and three, because, you know, that's part of the Columbus area. So, mm -hmm. but, um, you know, if Georgia, if no one gets over 50, if no one, um, gets over, um, 50% in the primary, it will go to a runoff in August. It was supposed to be in July, but the runoff, but the um, primary was delayed because of the, um, Coronavirus. The primary is actually on um, on um, on uh, June the 9th. So um, that's the the um, runoff would be on August the 11th. So um, you know that's pretty much where the state of things are in that race. Um, you know I, the races are turning. You know that race is actually turning out to be more competitive than I thought it was going to be. Like you know you have Purdue, who is not really the um, he's not loud in terms of you know he's not as well known as someone like Ted Cruz or um 
Josh Hawley. Like, you know, he's not really out there like that. <laughs> like, so, um, sorry, continue. Yeah, I was gonna say, um, David, David Perdue, he's you know, he's more of a um, quieter Republican, but he votes the party line. So, you know, anyway, what were you gonna say, Harrison? Uh, I was just going to bring up, since we're on the topic of Senate polls, Arizona, where the most mm -hmm. recent poll, I believe Ohio Predictive Insights did another poll. They had a McSally up, uh, sorry, they had a Kelly up by 13 points over McSally, which is the largest margin that he's been up by yet in a credible poll. And I think it essentially shows in conjunction with their polling on McSally's favorability ratings, which are significantly lower than Cinema. If you look at her net, it's minus seven versus Cinema, who's like plus 30 or something. The point I'm trying to get is a, uh, this race is certainly lean Democratic, and Kelly's far ahead of where cinema was at this point in the campaign. And if Kelly continues this, the race will just continue to push itself into Colorado standards by the end of the cycle. I mean, Nick yeah. Kelly is just digging a grave and continuing mm -hmm. to dig herself deeper into it with the way she's handling this campaign. Yeah, and, and I mean, back that up. the political article that came out this week, you know, with Republican-owned internals basically showing her in trouble in the same basic ballpark as the. Uh, Paul, you mentioned, I think it's very concerning in her end. I mean, what's the problem? What, what, what Sally has noticed is a lot of the problems that plagued her in 2018 uh, still are coming back and still haven't been addressed by her. And I'll give, you know, Mark Mark Kelly is one of the more better, was one of the best candidates they got, the Democrats this cycle. And he's very much going to run ahead of Biden in Arizona. And there's a very now good chance that this continues that uh, Mick Sally may be looking at a very bad margin of defeat than that most people which couldn't think was possible when, when this race began. Yeah. Mark Kelly, I mentioned this several times. I knew that he was going to be a good candidate. Like, you know, he's an astronaut. He's the wife of Congresswoman. He's the husband. I'm sorry, the husband of Congresswoman um, Gabby Giffords. So I had a feeling that he was going to be a um, that he was going to be a good candidate. I just didn't think that the race would be this lopsided with like how, how many months, like less than six months till the election. I didn't think that he'd be well ahead in the polls, like doubling her in fundraising. Mm -hmm. And um, I just didn't think that it would be this lopsided. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I mean, for me, I, I, I've i donated to McSally last time because I was genuinely offended by some of the stuff that Kristen Cinema had in her past. And I, that was a very bad decision because obviously the reason she lost is because I donated to her. Um, it seemed like the curse was now forever and that she's just completely gone off the rails. I think the problem is that Arizona isn't actually a state that wants a party line senator or the appearance oh, no. of one. Yeah. Definitely not. And so she had a she yeah. had a great record in the House, but she had to run far to the right to, you know, to make up for, for an attack from Kelly Kelly Ward who was blocking on Twitter and um, Joe Arpaio. So I mean Yeah. She had, by the time the by the time the election came around she won the primary decisively, but it was basically at the cost of her soul. And it really didn't, didn't work well, out gave, long term. And I mean, they gave Cinema an 18 free airtime. They just, you know, said herself, you know, list of who she was. And McSally had to play catch up with the rest of that. And camp. again, yeah. Kelly's Kelly's ahead of Cinema where Cinema was at this point of the camp. Yeah. yeah. They had mountains of oppo they could have put out on Christian Cinema. And they didn't use almost the stuff they put out was the weak sauce stuff. They had genuinely damaging stuff they could have put out on her, and they didn't. And that just shows how incompetent the Arizona Republican Party is. I mean, it, it's truly, I think it's almost near in California GOP levels of historical awfulness in terms of just how and bad they are at decision making. If we want to look at one more Senate race before, before we finish this, there was also a new poll mm -hmm. which showed um, Peters with a 48 to 42 lead over John James in Michigan. And the Republicans have a consistent fascination with John James, <laughs> including some on Twitter that want to put it as a toss up, even though. Uh, Peters has held that consistently and even now as the undecideds are starting to dry up. And yeah, uh, um, you know, a lot of us have spent a lot of time talking about this race. Gary Peters, um, he's only ever won in tough environments. Like in 2010, he was reelected. <laughs> he's only ever won in tough environments. Like in 2010, he was reelected as Democrats got slaughtered nationwide. He managed to win reelection in the House. Um, and in 2014, he, you know, granted he had a terrible opponent, um, like John James is miles ahead of what um, Terry Lynn Land was as a candidate. <laughs> but, um, you know, he still won by double digits as Democrats, again, got slaughtered nationwide. So he's only ever won in tough environments. So I, he's not someone that I would just, you know, write off if I were, you know, Republicans. Yeah. But 
Yeah. I mean, to be fair, a block of wood had more charisma than, than Terry Lynn did. So <laughs> that's not difficult to be to be better than. Um, yeah, I think with the Michigan Senate race, I think I think lean Democratic is still the appropriate rating. I mean, Jerry, we all agree with that rating, pretty much. I'd yeah, like, lean Democratic is fair. It, it's I a viable it's, option, but it's yeah. I, I'd say it's closer than Arizona at this point. But that's not yeah. saying a whole lot. Yeah. I mean, if I had to if I had to be asked what I think the final margin will be, I probably would say by a four or maybe three point Peters win. I mean, I think Biden is going to win Michigan. So, um, oh yeah, I mean, I think if the rumors are correct, Trump's uh, campaign in Michigan is right now a disaster as we speak, <laughs> and what he's done for on live television as well. Well, they've yeah. moved their focus to the crucial swing state of New Mexico. So, I mean, <laughs> that's a big battle. But I think that yeah, I don't. I'm not. I don't think that Trump is going to win Michigan either. And I don't think as probably. You saw yesterday in our uh, DM discussion, I don't think it's a must win for him either. I think that to be honest, obviously Florida is numero uno, but Arizona and Pennsylvania are probably even more important. Those two together, more important than Michigan is for him. Cause like I've thought for a while that let's just say that Trump wins, that Michigan will be, you know, the um, Michigan will be like the Indiana of uh, 2012 and that Michigan will flip back, obviously not by as big of a margin as uh, Indiana did for Romney, but yeah, I don't, I'm not seeing Trump um, doing that well there at all. And like I said, he doesn't need to, he just needs to make the Dems spend money there, which obviously the Democrats have to do, you can't take it for granted, uh, the way in which it was not ignored. Um, I kind of pushed back on the idea that Hillary ignored the states that people always complain about that she ignored, but it's not going to be neglected or taken for granted in the same way. Biden's um, people look more uh, campaign smart wise than Hillary people do with that part of the world. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, yeah. and Biden isn't Hillary Clinton on the most basic yeah. level. Yeah. Uh, on the Senate races, since this has become a hot topic on Twitter and mostly everywhere, the Montana Senate race. Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, yes. Montana. Uh, sure. Sure. <laughs> Steve Bullock. Um, Montana could be a whole episode. That's a fascinating race. Lewis, it really is a fascinating race. And um, has probably been the best recruit Democrats have gotten in the entire country. Uh, is it's great. Getting uh, Dane's uh, a fight. I mean, he's Mark a solid Kelly. recruit, but Mark Kelly is easily, in terms of fundraising, the Democrats' king, essentially. Right. He has yeah. more money than anyone else. He's been oh, he's longer than Bullock has, though. So. Yeah. And Bullock. Yeah. The Anderson. whole point with Bullock was to get this seat in the competitive race, which he's absolutely done. Yeah, and for sure. Giving Republicans a heart attack. Because um, it was interesting because I don't know if you all followed the timeline before Bullock entered the race, but, you know, everything was starting to fall into place. Like, you know, mm -hmm. okay, like Chuck Schumer flew out to Montana to meet with um, with um, Bullock. Then Obama flew out to Montana to meet with Bullock. <laughs> and then, then you had Trump tweeting about Steve Daines. Like, who tweets about Steve Daines? <laughs> <laughs> like, who tweets about Steve Daines? Like, no one knows who he is. Anyway, but, you know, everything was kind of starting to add up. Like, you know, okay, so when Bullock entered the race, I was like, oh, so that's why they were doing all of this. That's why Obama met with Schumer. That's why Obama met with Bullock. I'm sorry. That's why Obama met with Bullock. That's why Schumer met with Bullock. So, well, yeah, it's going to be an interesting race for sure. And he has the added fact that he's an incumbent Democratic governor running for a seat in a red state, not a former Democratic governor running for a seat in a red state. And many people have talked about it before. People like Bredson and Strickland definitely didn't work for them. Yeah. And yeah. Also, you, also, you have the, um, you know, there's really not much that can be gained from the coronavirus at all. But being an incumbent governor, during you know and you're running you're running for another office or you're running for re-election whatever the case may be um if you're on the ballot and you're an incumbent governor you know you know you're you, 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 it'll pretty much be a referendum on your handling of the crisis and the thing is steve Daines and most governors have had a boost from this yeah mm -hmm. an unknown senator in the sense so he hasn't even been able to define himself in the now almost six years he's had the job so that's another you know concern for ours here is Daines is practically not be the senator, but in terms of recognition, Bullock is a wide-ranging, much more name recognition than him. And yeah. it's interesting too because Montana is set to gain um, an annual power vote, I believe, um, from 2020. Um, yeah, and the congressional district. Yeah. 
but also, but I mean, it def and it's also the state is like not quite as red as, you know, its neighbors anyway. I mean, Bill Clinton won it once, he narrowly lost it in 96. And then I know Obama did a couple compared to Kerry. And, uh, Obama nearly won it. I don't know the exact numbers right now. Does anybody know? about as close as Missouri. Yeah, I think Obama came within like two or three, I think, of winning the state in 2008. It was just a little bit, it was less close to Missouri, but it was still competitive. Yeah. And a lot of that, I, mean, I think a lot of the reason why it could be become more competitive in the future is because of the fact that you have people moving from California into the state. You know, some people who, you know, want, who want a cheaper, want a cheaper place to live, who like the kind of rural nature of it, you know, that could be a thing. But then, of course, you also have Republicans fleeing the state um, who, of California who don't, who don't like taxes and everything. So that could possibly make it redder on the state level, too. So that'll be one to watch in terms of the years, in terms of how competitive it will be. It could get even redder. It could continue to be elastic or we'll see. Yeah, Montana is an interesting state because Republic is solidly Republican on paper at the presidential level. It should be solidly, you know, looking at presidential performances there recently, you think it would be a solidly red state, but it's not. I think it's a combination of Democrats having a strong state party and Republicans having a weak one. Like um, this, you know, for governor this 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 time around, they're running Greg Gianforte, who not only lost the um, governor race in 2016, but he's a pretty weak candidate. Like, you know, he has anger management issues. He's, yeah. you know. I mean, so, he's physically imposing. If, if, yeah, if they want to, if they think the governor of Montana is going to be decided by a cage match, he's a decent candidate. But this is <laughs> that sort of situation. Yeah, I think um, Tim Fox would definitely he have been the body so that Mike Cooney or something. <laughs> <laughs> I definitely think. Um, <laughs> I definitely think Tim Fox would be a stronger candidate because he was the best performing Republican in Montana in 2016. So um, the fact that, you know, Gianforte ran was, a, you know, kind of a, um, you know, it's kind of hard to see him, see his candidacy being beneficial to Republicans, but who knows. But uh, Cooney, I definitely think he's a good candidate. You know, I, we're supposed to be talking about Senate races, I know, but <laughs> but um, looking at the governor I mean, we're wrapping up anyway. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, Cooney, I definitely think he's a strong candidate. Like, you know, he's been in politics forever. Like <laughs> he's been in politics since like, re since Ronald Reagan was president. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah. so yeah. he's definitely a strong candidate. So, and so people seem to think that it would be Cooney and, um, Gianforte. So that would be an interesting race for sure. Yeah. Oh. And before we wrap up, I have one more thing I wanted to show. I've been working on this while you guys were talking since you were doing a great job. I had mentioned the possibility of a South Bend to uh, to Gary seat. It's really mm -hmm. yeah. viable. I've, I just I just made this really quickly. Not bad. Um, the Democrat, yeah, the Democratic yeah. seat here uh, would have given Obama sixty eight percent of the vote instead of sixty one percent, and then the remaining green portion, on average, um, which is supposedly Democratic areas, these counties, is actually uh, Republicans would win at twenty twelve to twenty sixteen. The composite's about twenty percentage points. So this is a really viable option, I think, for them if they wanted to just get rid of the possibility of a second district that's any issue. Mm -hmm. They just want to get rid of, you know, get rid of a potential issue in, in other regards. But that's just a possibility. Um, I, I so just Eric, like, Eric um, how much time do we have left? Because you know, there were a few other Senate races that I wanted to go over. Uh, if you can do lightning round, if you can do them in a couple minutes, then go right ahead. Uh, well, um, Iowa, so that primary is... Um, on June 2nd, I think that's one of the more competitive um, primaries on June 2nd, even though it's looking it's looking like um, Teresa Greenfield will easily win the primary. Um, but, um, you know, that will be an interesting race. Joni Ernst, she's um, she's, um, you know, she was seen as a rising star in the party when she first ran, but she's kind of laid low since then. So it'll be interesting to see how she campaigns. But um, Maine is, well, I think this will be the last one I discuss is Maine. Um, Susan <laughs> Collins is definitely going to have the toughest race of her career. So um, mm -hmm. that will be interesting. Like, you know, she's being outraised. You know, that's never happened before. Like, you know, being her, Susan Collins being outraised, that's never happened before. So yeah. it'll be interesting to see how that, how she, and I'm, I've never actually seen her campaign before like she's never had to campaign before she's always mm -hmm. won re-election with like over 60 percent of the vote 
And that's she increased gonna her happen. margin every single election, even through OA, she was increasing her margins. Yeah, and that's not going to happen this time. It's going to be very, very close. Um, and she's she's actually in for a tough race, and that's never happened before. So that'll be interesting. But um, that's pretty much all I wanted to um, go yeah, over. Yeah, I think this was great. I think we got discussed a lot of great things here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah. Um, yeah, thanks for hanging around for uh, for this episode. Uh, hopefully, if you had any comments on the new format, I'd uh, love to hear them. Um, I think we've done a good job, but yeah, thanks to everyone for showing up. I think Robert uh, had to go, Kraus one earlier, but thanks for Niles for showing up for coming uh, mm -hmm. on for our first episode. Uh, Sammy Harrison, thanks for for being here. Mm -hmm. um, hopefully, we'll be doing this again next week, or we should we should be doing it again next week. Um, I think we'll focus on another sort of house race as we probably got south west left. I think it, I think it'd be so, interesting to do one on on the presidential race relating to Biden Biden's B, uh, VP choice too eventually. Oh yeah. Yeah, if they that. announce that soon, because they've already announced some people that have been um, in positions to be uh, vetted for candidacies. So yeah, so that's, that's, that's discussed, really but, interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, uh, yep. Thanks for hanging around. Uh, thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next week. Of course. Yeah. See you. Later. Thank you. Bye, Eric. Bye bye. Bye. Wait.